Our epistle reading today is Galatians chapter 2, and this serves as our message theme for this morning. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To begin the sermon today, I want to put you all into a theoretical situation. I want you to imagine for me that you've all done some horrible, horrible crime that's punishable by death. You've gone to trial, you've been declared guilty by a jury of your peers, and your name has been destroyed the world over in every, uh, me- every media outlet imaginable. In fact, there isn't a place on earth that you could turn to and not be recognized immediately and turned on by the public. Your relationships with your family, with your friends, and even with perfect strangers have been completely and utterly destroyed. Your punishment for this crime is very naturally to be put to death, but you await this punishment in a jail cell made specifically just for you. The world locks you away on a remote island where you will never be seen or heard from ever again. Your cell consists of three concrete walls that extend for thousands of feet in every direction. And your cell bars are made of the strongest metal in the entire world. As a sick joke, the law comes by and tosses a wooden spoon into your jail cell. And it tells you that if you can dig your way out through the concrete and metal with that wooden spoon, then you can earn your own freedom. So you spend your days toiling away, digging at that concrete wall to absolutely no avail. Until one day the Apostle Paul arrives at your door cell to tell you that somebody else took the blame for you. Somebody else died in your place. They took your death. And he tells you that not only have you been declared innocent now, but you're actually restored with the rest of the world. Everyone has forgiven you. Those relationships with your family, with your friends, and even with those strangers have all come back as if you never committed those crimes at all. So what are you going to do, the Apostle Paul asks? Are you going to get up and live a life of freedom outside of this jail cell? Or are you going to keep plugging away at that concrete wall with your wooden spoon? Now, as silly and obvious as this metaphor may seem, we still have all found a way to turn down Paul's offer found here in Galatians chapter 2. Daily, we are beckoned out of a life in chains, out of a life where we are cut off from the rest of the world, completely locked away by the law. And we're called into a life of freedom, a fully restored life with Christ. We look at that old wooden spoon And we think to ourselves, if I just had a little bit more time to dig, if my spoon was just a little bit sharper, or if I just had a little bit better technique, then I could finally earn my own freedom. It's an incredibly difficult thing to walk away from, especially in our culture where everything must be earned. And free gifts are almost looked down upon as a bad thing. There's this American idea that you have to build yourself up out of nothing to come from the rubble and climb that social and economic ladder all by yourself. 
Even Peter, in the first part of Galatians chapter 2, struggles with this same problem of trying to fulfill the law for himself. He stops eating with the Gentile Christians when the other Jews show up. And he basically tells those Gentiles with his actions that us Jews have done the works of the law necessary to get into God's kingdom. And you Gentile sinners, you still have a long way to go. And Peter feared being seen with those who were uncircumcised because they hadn't done as much work of the law as he and his Jewish brothers had done. And the struggle continues with us today because we are all experts at justifying ourselves, aren't we? However, in our lives, these, these things play out in slightly different ways than they did for Peter and Paul. And one particularly strong way that this plays out today is in the group that feels that if they do enough work, then they will be in. This could be at their actual paying job. This could be as a mother or a father, as a husband or a wife, as a friend, or even as a charitable worker. In fact, I myself fall victim to this ideology all the time as a vicar. If I, can't, if I can teach enough Bible studies, then I'll finally know enough about the Bible to be into God's kingdom. If I forgive enough of other people's sins, then I can finally outrun the sins of my own past. If I confess every single thing that I can think of as I approach the communion rail this week, then I can finally stop doing those sins next week. And maybe, just maybe, if I go to enough deathbeds and give enough commendation of the dying, it'll secure the fact that somebody else will do that for me when I'm in their position. Sometimes it also plays out as a spouse. If I cook this meal just right, then I'll finally be deserving of my husband or wife's love. If I resist all temptation to look at that attractive man or that attractive woman walking down the street, or resist the temptation to linger on that Instagram ad of a partially dressed man or woman, then I will finally overcome and fix my past sexual improprieties for myself. Perhaps for others it comes in the form of parenthood. Right now, for me, I fall victim to the idea that if I just pray hard enough, if I pray the right prayer, then my child will be healthy and they'll have a faith in Christ that never, ever wavers. If I start running and I get physically fit and if I get my financial life more together, then I'll finally be that perfect parent and I can be the one that never wavers and shows my child what it's like to be a Christian adult. Another significant way that this plays out in the Christian church is through piety and holiness for their own sake and for your own gain. We all love religion. Even the atheist among us loves being religious about their atheism. And we all try to be pious for our own gain at some point or another. In fact, it's that same old temptation that Luther fought against in the 1500s against the Catholic Church to do enough good works, to pray the right prayer the right amount of times, to volunteer at the right church events, and to do those things that God commands us to do in the law. And eventually, somehow, God will give us access into eternal life because of these things. I mean, who among us hasn't remarked in their own head or amongst their family about that person that we haven't seen at church in a little while? Who among us hasn't worked really hard at a church ministry and thought to themselves, if only for a minute, I'm better than those other people who didn't help. We begin to feel that our performance of the law gives us some special dispensation from God, or at least it gives us a leg up on the competition around us. If you really start to take into account your own life, you'll start to see that like me, you too have an addiction to that old wooden spoon, desperately scraping at the concrete wall. And we keep on scraping, 
ever hopeful that a beam of light will sneak through and eventually will earn our way out of those prison walls of the law. It's a result that never can happen and never, ever will happen. In the last verse of our reading for today, the Apostle Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. This verse does a really good job of putting it all in perspective for us. Because Christ is the one that took the blame. Christ is the one who bore the wrath of God the Father. He died our death and he took our place. So when the Apostle Paul comes bearing that good gospel news that Jesus has saved you, when he arrives at your jail cell door and you take a good, hard, long look at that wooden spoon and you respond back, Nah, I'm good. I've got this. What you're actually saying is, no thanks, God. I don't need your grace. I'm good on my own. And you attempt to nullify the greatest act of love and service that anyone has ever done. And we all do that every single day. The good news for us is that the good news doesn't go away just because we reject it sometimes. And it isn't any less effective for us despite our willingness to turn it down regularly. Verse 16 in our reading for today says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So we have also believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. The only thing necessary for you to do to get out of your jail cell that the law has kept you in is to believe that the guy who said he died and rose for you actually did it. He wants you out of that prison. And at the end of the day, we are the only ones keeping ourselves in there. But he keeps calling us out day after day to join him in a life of freedom, a life where he renews you daily and declares you innocent every single time that you falter. But you also get so much more than freedom when you walk out of that jail cell. You get a restored relationship with God, your creator with your loved ones, with the people of the world. And one day, you'll even get a fully restored relationship with creation itself. Because when Jesus died your death and took your place and opened that cell door for you, he asked you to walk with him into a life of perfect eternity, a perfect resurrected life that he has gone into first and is beckoning you into with him. So cast that old wooden spoon that you keep digging away with. Throw that spoon away and run instead to the old wooden cross, which tells you every day that you are free in Christ Jesus' death and resurrection. I think the natural next question is, how are we going to live as people who have been freed by Christ? And here's the rub. We do need to consider how we are doing as followers of Jesus. But as soon as we do so, we start to imagine that it's how we are doing that matters. It's almost like an arrow shot out of a bow stopping mid-flight to inspect itself to see how it's flying. Don't give up. Just own the reality of the struggle. The one simple solution that I can give you is to keep doing those holy things that you're already doing. Attend those Bible studies. Ask people over for lunch. Go to church every single week. Pray without ceasing. Do charitable works, but do it because of the love that you have for other people because of Christ and not a desire to earn anything at all, especially not eternal life. Because you were freed from bondage. You were bought and paid for with a price. With a price of the most holy and precious blood of the Lamb of God. 
Now, the person that does works out of love is a joyful person. They're a person that's happy to be serving, happy to be helping. They do not look down on others who don't do as much as them. They do not get prideful about all that they have accomplished. And they look at Christ and they try to emulate Him as the one who set them free. And they try to do that for other people as a joy-filled response. My last charge to you today is this. Tell the rest of the world about the freedom that they have in Christ. Because there are so many people who are stuck in their jail cell, digging away at the concrete wall with their own wooden spoon. And they've never taken the time to turn around and see that the cell door has been open this whole time. So be the Apostle Paul for them. Walk to their cell door and tell them about the one who set them free. Tell them about the one who died in their place and opened the cell door for them and is beckoning them into a perfect eternal life, a perfectly restored life, a perfectly forgiven life. Because when you walk out of that cell door, it's no longer you who lives, but Christ who lives in you. Amen. We have a weekly awakening question for you today, and it's this. Will you stay in the jail cell, or will you come out and enjoy your freedom? Will you stay in the jail cell, or will you come out and enjoy your freedom?